Welcome to the Gritty Podcast, friends. I am here in studio with my brother, the Gritty Broman, and today's podcast is with Bill Vanderheiden of uh, Iron Will Broadheads. We met up with him at the Western Hunt Expo. We talked about his head, and he has a really cool new product called the K1 Ultra Light Knife. We talk about that as well. From now on, we're going to try to keep the intro extremely short, jump right into the podcast, and then... For all you diehard Gritty fans, you can hang on because at the end of the podcast, we're going to go over things we hot like, things we hate, deals, discounts, giveaways, things like that. We're going to go to the mailbag, read your comments and, and that sort of thing. So for those of you who want to stick around for that, that'll be at the end. I hope you enjoy the show. Check out Iron Will Broadheads. Go to ironwillouffitters.com. You can see their broad list of broadhead options. One thing I do like about these broadheads that we've covered on the podcast in the last few days. If you remember, we went over the Valkyrie in episode 434, the Valkyrie broadhead with Brent Hahn. We also just did the Ozcat broadhead with the Aussie boys, Nick Morton, and Jerry uh, Redman, and Jerry Redman on uh, their episode 437. And then this one is uh, Iron Will. All three, the things that they have in common, heavy, durable, built to last, can reuse, very sharp, uh, and can be resharpened, made made uh, well. So, dig all the products. I'd say my favorite is still, still Valkyrie, but I'm going to run them all. And in certain situations, I could see me staying away from Valkyrie, given the cost, and uh, switching to one of the other ones, especially for certain hunts like pigs and stuff like that. So... Hope you enjoy the show. Stick around at the end. We got some cool giveaways you might be excited about. So with that, let's jump into the show. All right, folks. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and uh, I am here with Bill Vanderheiden of Iron Will Broadheads. And you've been on the podcast before. Came to my house when I was in Evergreen. That's right. It's been about maybe a year. About a year ago, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're at the Western Hunt Expo. Let's hear about Iron Will and what you're doing right now. Yeah, well, first off, thanks a lot for having me on a year ago. That really helped get the word out, and uh, and we grew a lot last year, so I really appreciate that. So, yeah. And we've got uh, we've got some new products coming out. Um, we had a, a vented series and then a solid series, um, a broadhead. Well, we vented our solid blades, and uh, we had a lot of people asking for a solid blade 100 grain, so... I'm just coming out with that here. We'll be shipping that another month or so. Been working on some uh, impact collars. So I found myself when I was uh, doing destructive testing, shooting into bones, things like that. Sometimes I was the component system or arrows would become the weak point and I would start breaking out arrows. So um, start making these hardened stainless steel sleeves, one inch long to just reinforce my own arrows for those destructive testings. And then I started hunting with them myself the last couple of years and a lot of people were seeing them and asking me if they could buy them. So we just, just released those recently as well, and that's become pretty popular. Okay. Yeah, I've noticed as I test different systems and I'm, I'm using different heads, that that spot right right behind the broadhead, mm-hmm. you know, where you thread it, that that is a weak spot. It can You can break quite a few arrows right there. The carbon just isn't built to take some of those oblique angle impacts on, like, a bone. Right, right. Yeah, if you're using, like, a... Eastern axis or, or other arrows with a, with a hit insert. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not a lot of side support right at the end where there's just carbon on there. So that's why I like to reinforce it with that one inch of hardened steel. That really helps it out. And there's other component systems out there, but a lot of times they're, they're pretty low end materials and, yeah. and that becomes a weak point. And you hit something hard and, and it's not spinning true anymore after that hit. So now that you've got another season. And you and and I know just a ton of guys that are running the heads. Mm-hmm. What has the feedback been? Yeah, it's been great. I was amazed at um, ATA this year. It's just, just my second year there. Yeah. That uh, that everybody already knew about Iron Wheel Broadheads, and all the guys in the industry that were coming up and saying that either they were shooting them or a buddy of theirs was shooting them, and and had great results. I probably had I probably had thirty people or more tell me that. They got pass through shots on elk, including a, either a single or double shoulder blade pass through, and yeah. and that was great to hear because that's really how I got started in the whole thing. Is um, you know, I shot a bull, hit the back edge of the shoulder blade, broadhead failed, and I got very little penetration. So 
that was my original goal is just get through that shoulder blade, through the vitals. You know, that it's so close right there. You can hit, I think you can just hit that bone. And, um, and yeah, I think it makes all the difference in the world to have a broadhead that's, that's strong enough. They can get through there, not be bent, and the edge still be sharp and get yeah. that pass through shot. So that was great to hear. I'll tell you what, I remember a couple of years ago when I got my first iron wheel broadhead, you know, I heard it was like close to a hundred bucks for, for three of them. Right. My first thought was, yeah, there's no market for this. Like it's, mm-hmm. that's just too expensive for something I might break or lose. And it doesn't seem like I need it. There's other options that do a great job. Mm-hmm. Then you get more experience, more time, and and more arrows flown, more animals killed, and and now that seems like a no brainer, you know. Yeah. For it, for the head mm-hmm. to to be built at the level that your gear, that your bow and your arrows are crafted, it just makes sense to make sure you have that kind of head on there when you've spent as much time, money, and energy building a system. It just, it's a mistake to go cheap on that. It is. And it's just a different way of thinking for a lot of people. They're just used to that being a, a low cost disposable paying 10, 10 or 12 bucks a piece for them. Um, and really I, I designed and engineered this for myself. I wanted to have kind of the ultimate broadhead for my own use. You know, yeah. I was a mechanical engineer doing product development for companies already. And, uh, so I really engineered it for myself, but I didn't care what the costs were going to be. I wanted it to be just the ultimate performance. And really, it, I spent seven years iterating on the design, but the last three or four years of just using it then on the final design, and I still wasn't really planning to bring it to market because I thought it would be too expensive. I didn't think people would pay that much for it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I met a, a friend up in the mountains, and, um, and he really pushed me to come out. We brought it out. And and, you know, we got a lot of pushback on cost initially, but once people got it in their hand and saw it and then actually shot through an animal with it, it's a step change improvement to what people are used to. And the people that have actually used it, they're like, oh, man, it's totally worth, worth the cost. So, And tell me this. So you have a Tonto tip on mm-hmm. there, which for people who don't know, describe that, like your overall design. Yeah, so... Um, you know, it's a two blade with bleeder and the main blade, you know, on a lot of two blade, the main blade goes at one angle all the way to the point and it's fairly long. Um, and the Tonto tip just adds this second sharper angle at the end. So it's an 80 degree angle and that's brought back in. So it reduces the overall length a lot. You know, our, our length would be close to two inches if we stayed at that same angle, but it's only 1.1.2 inches total length with that with that um, Tonto tip. And it does a couple things. It makes it fly way better. Right. Um, so there's less surface area to plane and cause a problem there. And it also has a lot of strength to that tip. Yeah. When you get that long tip out there, um, you know, bending strength is proportional to the length uh, cubed. So you can break those, um, those tips off really easy when it's a long, thin blade. So uh, bringing that Tonto tip in and shortening it up just adds a lot of strength. So right. for bone impacts, um, we won't break a blade that way. And why did you go with, and, and this probably ties in somewhat to the Tonto tip, why did you go with a double beveled broadhead instead of a single? So I read all the Ashby reports, and I really started like researching what's already been learned in, in broadheads. So I read the Ashby reports. He liked the single bevel. He said that it would torque and break out a bigger hole through bone. Um, but So I did some of my own testing. And, you know, some of the difference might have been that he had a, you know, a recurve shooting very slow, close up, things like that. But in my own testing through bone, single and double bevel seem to do pretty similar. They're both breaking. They're, if, if it's very strong construction, very strong blade and thick enough, they're breaking through that bone and breaking a big enough hole that the rest of the arrow passes through. So I didn't see the advantage in the, in the single bevel over the double bevel just for for bone breaking, you know, for penetration, it, it, um, a single bevel will add some rotation. I don't think that's as big a deal as people make it out to be. I think you get, you know, from what I've seen, you get maybe one rotation or probably less than that through an animal. Yeah. I don't see that as a big factor either. Okay. The advantages I like in the, in the double bevel is that, um, you know, you're grinding back and forth both sides. Um, I think you can, we can get a better edge that way and a stronger edge in a double bevel, I believe, and get a sharper edge, I think, as well than you get with a, with a single bevel. With a single bevel, typically you're grinding one side and you might remove the burr on the backside. And I think it's just not as strong. When you hit something, it's more likely to, 
to bend over. Yeah. It depends on what angle you make it, but um, and how thick the steel is, and how thick the steel material. is, what angle. Yeah. But but in general, you know, I, I like the double bevel for strength and, and durability. Yeah, I was going to say if there's anything I've learned in the last couple of years is there's more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah. You know, and there are different broadheads are devastating. And there's there's mm-hmm. there's a few le- a few I feel that are and we've had them on the podcast broadheads that I think are a cut above the rest that are really leading the pack in terms of innovation and materials and builds. Uh, you know, I get some of these that are thirty bucks for a pack, and you screw them in, and they're wobbling all the way in. Mm-hmm. And then when you spin them, their the arrows just whoop whoop whoop. You know, yeah. yeah. And having tighter tolerances and and broadheads like I remember being with Aaron and. Snyder and we had these mechanical broadheads <clears throat> and Aaron would bend the ferrule. Yeah. Like the opposite, every head needed to be like pressed against the table and bent into yeah. position and then it would spin. And uh, I suppose if you're hunting a turkey or something, it's like, uh, whatever. But if you yeah, can you know bend what? it on the table to make it true <laughs> and then you're going to shoot an elk with it, it just seems like a bad idea. Yeah, you know, we, we make our ferals on a, a Swiss CNC machine, and our, our typical run out um, or concentricity is about a ten thousandth of an inch. And and I know a lot of compo- as more I get in the industry and I hear about where other people's components are made, a lot of them are made just the lowest cost material there is, and then they're using machines that are 1930s lays that can only hold four thousandths of an inch tolerance at best. And so, um, yeah, there's a big difference in. And what you typically are going to get retail versus, yeah, a few of us trying to make the, the best prop products we can. Yeah. Yeah. You know, going into this next year, what would you like to see happen with uh, Iron Will? You know, we're, we're taking input on what people want to see. Um, and we really like our current product line. We don't plan to change that at all, but we might add some broadheads going forward. You know, we just added the solid, solid 100 grain. We added a, a buff 200, a buff 250, we call it, where we remove the bleeder blades and just have the really heavy ones. And those are really, um, we had a bunch of guys going to Africa for Cape Buffalo and asking yeah. me, what, which of your broadheads should I use? And I thought, you know, I haven't really designed that one yet. I would take the bleeders out. <laughs> so I made some of those. Um, we just sold a bunch of those. Uh, and we had four or five guys uh, come by the booth and say they shot through Cape Buffalo uh, this past year with our S225 heads, just removing the bleeder, which would be a similar okay. head. So I think that'll, that'll do well. Um, yeah, the impact collars I mentioned. I also, um, I've been I've been wanting an ultralight knife made out of a premium blade steel. I haven't been too happy with selection, so I've spent a couple of years working on an ultralight knife. So that that's new here. Oh wow! That weighs uh, it weighs one ounce. It's the same steel, um, heat treat process, sharpening process, blade angle as our broadheads. So I mean, you can shave really easy with it. Woo! I, I used one. I got completely through my elk and mule deer with the same one. You know, skinning, deboning. Skinning, quartering, deboning without having to touch it up. So it holds an edge a long time. And, you know, I'd been carrying two knives. I don't really like the replacement blade knives. I just, I don't like busting one on that hip socket or, or having to change them out. All, all my buddies have cut themselves on them, you know. Yeah. So I like a fixed blade knife, but to get good steel, I was carrying, and I was carrying a backup. So I was carrying about a pound worth of knives on these backpack hunts. Wow. Now I can carry one yeah, ounce yeah. Or, or bring a spare. I carry two ounces of knives total, so. So this knife right here, how, how easy is it to sharpen? It's not too bad. So A2 steel, even though it's 60 Rockwell C, I mean, very hard. It holds an edge really long. It's not too bad to resharpen. There's high-end knife makers that use it. It's a very uniform structure. It's not like some of the super steels where there's these hard carbides in there that make it really hard to put an edge back on. Okay. It touches up pretty well. We have a, a sharpening stone we sell now, and I'm coming out with another sharpener that just makes it really easy to touch up as well. Sweet. So you can get through, how many did you say? So I, I got through my elk and uh, mule deer with one, okay. and then I used a different one. I got through, I got a big bear in Colorado and my whitetail, and I caped my whitetail with a sec, with my backup one. So my, my plan was is to make sure you can get through a one animal completely like an elk and still be sharp on a backcountry hunt. And I think you could actually get through two animals with it before you'd have to touch it up. That's great. I remember when I hunted with my buddy Anthony. I don't remember what it was because I don't nerd out on that stuff. But it was some kind of hardened steel mm-hmm. that he had to have uh, a, a guy sharpen with a grinder. Really, because out in the field, he just couldn't get it very sharp. It was real yeah. tough. Yeah. But it would hold the edge for two or three elk. But once you were 
done. I mean, you need to take it in and have it. And it depends how, how far you let it get before you touch That's, it up. Yeah. And so. I had the guys from SE on, and they, okay. did, they explained that, you know, SE Knives, and they were, they were saying, you know, if you touch it up frequent and early enough, there's, there's, it's actually fairly easy to keep it sharp. It's when you just let it go and go and go, and then. Yeah. So I, I'm going to be coming out here soon with a carbide sharpener, just two blades at the right angle already, where you can just draw it through there. And if you just have light pressure and draw through there and touch it up, as, as you just start to notice it's getting a little duller, I, I think you could just maintain it that way. But yeah, if you let it go too far, then you have to regrind that, that edge back completely. It takes a bit more. Dang. Very cool. Can people buy these yet? We just put them on for uh, pre-sale yesterday, so they'll be shipping in, in April, but we just started selling them on our website yesterday. Yeah, so, I like yeah. this. It's so tiny, so light. <laughs> you can keep that one. It's got a nice thing. I, I'm gonna, this is a nice angle for skinning and doing the whole, the whole bit. Yeah, it's 19 degrees per side, which, which makes it a really nice sharp knife. Um, you can resharpen it at, at 20, and you just take a little off the, off the edge. And Very cool. What is that the... Um, we've got a, this is new from last year too. So okay. we worked with SKB to uh, make a broadhead case. So they made the case and I spec'd out the, um, oh, sweet. The, some high density foam so we could just clamp the blades on the faces and not touch the edges. So that's a yeah, military spec, waterproof, dustproof travel case. So I really wanted something that I could throw in this pack or go throw in, you know, go to Alaska or whatever and have a nice place to carry them. So. That's these, been our. That's been really popular as well. Yeah, very cool. These bleeder blades are. Uh, they're bleeders. Yeah, they're they're a must. When I look at two blade designs that don't have a bleeder, yeah. I just. I mean, I know it'll make a nice slit. It'll, it, but I, it just, I feel like it just doesn't allow the blood to escape the way that it does when you add yeah. the bleeder. It's surprising to me how many people don't think a bleeder's needed or don't don't have value in it and. And I started without a bleeder. So for two years, I didn't have one in my original broadhead design. And we shot a bunch of annals between my brother and myself and my friends. And occasionally, you just get a really poor blood trail. Occasionally, yeah. just that single slice closes up too easy. But And it's obvious to me now, but that cross cut, it just, the corners pull back from that hole and it just stays open. Yep. And you just get more blood. And you're also adding three quarters inch cut. So instead of our inch and a sixteenth, main blade now we have three quarter inch cross cut so one over 1. 1.8 inches total cut you know they bleed more and they die faster and yeah. it, it's a big improvement i think and in that smaller bleeder set back it doesn't really hurt you in penetration very much you know, very little and it doesn't affect flight at all so you're just getting more uh, more cut and you know no real negatives to it so i mean the negative is it more complex to put it in there and a little more cost to build it and and it took me a few iterations to get the the design to where I felt like I wasn't weakening the ferrule, you know, to have a strong ferrule with the bleeder. But I'm really happy with the current design. We haven't okay. seen any ferrule issues with it. So, so your outsert, people can buy that now? They can. Yep, we're shipping those. What do you call that? We call it an impact collar. Okay, impact so, collar. So um, it's similar to a, a footer. You know, trad guys for years have been slicing uh, uh, or cutting sections of aluminum arrows and bonding them over theirs. and. It's similar to that, but also has a flange over the end, so it protects the end of the arrow. So you just slide it on, and your broadhead or, or um, field point will hold it on. You can epoxy them on as well for a little added strength, but you don't have yeah. to. I'm yeah. excited to, to try it out some more, you know, go Great. through its paces. I've got a setup I'm building right now, the slightly different arrow build. And I've always been a fan of those, you know, strong metal outserts. Right. Um uh, you know, impact collar. Some, yeah, um, some you know don't Valkyrie. Than others. You know Valkyrie. Is, I know you, mm -hmm. you've shot them before, and um, and I, I like their system. They have that center pin in that um, in that sleeve go, goes yep. over it. I forget what they call it. Center pin sleeve, maybe something um, like that. This would be similar to that. Where, and they do the one six six diameter, so they have that center pin, but it's a pretty small diameter. You know, like mm -hmm. a, like a deep six size diameter. So. We're making this impact collar for the 204 diameters. Which is what my other setup is. Okay. And so I'll, I'm shooting like the Black Eagle Rampage. Yeah. It's a, one of my favorite arrows. It's, it's, it's a thin arrow, but it's just not micro diameter. Right. I like that 204 diameter size. I, mm -hmm. I shot the Deep Six for a year, and then I went back to 204. I, I just You get about double the strength just from that 204 diameter versus 165. Just yeah. look at the strength and bending with that shank. And so, 
Yeah, you could double your strength with the 204 and then add the impact collar. We also make the impact collar for the deep six size, though. So you can shoot the, the carbon injection or, you know, gold tip pierce or Black Eagle has a one six five as well. Is it, is it fit the X-Impact? Yep. It will. Yep. Okay. It, you, you'd have to use a deep six hit insert and then a deep six broadhead, but then you could use our impact collar over that okay. as well. I, I've got a, a whole different build out because <clears throat> I just, for one thing, I want to test different setups. But mm-hmm. two, I want to shoot Total Archery Challenge. Yeah. And I want to run arrows that I that I don't mind losing. Yeah. And then when I I want to make, make those uh, interchangeable. So why would I'm, you lose one, Brian? Well, you know I I know it's <laughs> it's uncommon because there are 120 yard shots. <laughs> I know through I the trees. It, I shot it last year for the first time. And yeah. I, yeah, I lost a couple arrows too. I just want to tinker. So mm-hmm. I want to play with different broadheads, different arrow builds, different setups. Right. I'm actually setting up four different arrows myself, from the micro to medium, and, and playing around with FOC amounts. And yep. so I understand what you're saying. If you want to play around with different arrows and things, it's hard to use a non-standard system and, and, and do much with it. So yeah. that's why we try to offer the some standard systems, I guess. Right. And the, the Valkyrie system is expensive. It's designed a certain way, and I love it. But I also love this this Rampage system I've got. And the iron will is perfect for that. And I've got a bunch of hunts where I want to see, you know, see that performance, you know, see, see how it does. You know, the only way to really test this stuff, you know, is to use it Yeah, it in is. a l- real situation. So I care about flight a lot. I also care about penetration. Right. Uh, I want a hole that bleeds pretty good, mm-hmm. although I'm less interested in a gaping hole like I used to be. Used yeah. to like those mechanicals a little bit. Yeah, I've, I've listened to your podcast, it. so I've heard how you kind of changed over you know, the, over yeah. the years. Right? I hate mechanical broadheads <laughs> now, and no, 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 you know, nothing against. I mean, people can choose what works for them, but I despise them. Maybe yeah. for like I said, small game or what? Well, a very famous person here just stopped by my booth and said that he. He just shot a moose with a mechanical and got three inches of penetration. And I told my, so I just tested, uh, I had a fresh moose hide from, from a friend of mine and I tested different broadheads that forced to penetrate through it. And our broadhead, I posted this video, our broadhead took 14 pounds to push down through the moose hide, just, you know, cut like butter basically. And moose hide is thick and there's yes. a lot of hair on that. And I took some of the top mechanicals right now and pushed down through as well as some of the trocar, um, well, some of like the three, three blade chisel point type. Yeah. heads and so i took 14 pounds at 160 pounds they hadn't cut through it yet and they started crushing the blocks i had below it the foam blocks so it takes so much force to push through there and i was explaining that to him that yeah it's we're going to get 10 times the penetration um you know maybe not i mean the tissue is a softer to push through right but just getting through that hide in that rib bone on a mechanical that's a tremendous amount of energy taken up just to get that far i've just learned over time Sometimes the animal's in a facing a direction or is of, of a certain size that the only way you're going to get it through to the to do the most damage is if it passes through a foot of other stuff that's yeah. non-critical, you know, or right like a, a sharp quartering away shot. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot to get through before you get to the vitals. And right? if and if it's a smaller animal like a whitetail, and it actually goes through a shoulder, mm-hmm. you know, somehow, and it's like. Man, I want that arrow to go all the way through. Not just six inches in, not just three inches in. I don't want a giant hole so much anymore as I want, want one that travels the length of the body. And you want to have those shot options too, right? Exactly. Like, um, Tony Treach, I was talking to him, and he, he had a downward shot on a mule deer buck. Trying to shoot straight down, he was off of a cliff, right? And to make that shot with a mechanical, it would have been tough. With ours, he put it right through the spine, and it severed the spine in two and made it through to the vitals. And yeah. I think with a mechanical, with the shoulder blades there and the spine, Not that's a risky option. shot. You yeah. know? That's a very I risky shot. I agree. It's, it seems odd to me that you would run, choose to run that. Because, I mean, when you shoot with that mechanical, there's always that risk that it won't do what you need it to do unless you have that perfect broad hide, broadside setup shot. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I see these guys at full draw waiting for that exact position. And I'm thinking, man, if you had a different arrow build and yeah. a better broadhead, mm-hmm. you'd just shoot them now. you just take the shot now. My last two mule deer I got were, were quartering on, just like quartering on. And, and I just, I mean, I could tell where the bones are, and, I, and I'm confident that, okay, if I hit that bone, I still know what's going through. Yep. And 
one of them I hit just inside the bone and zipped all the way through, and then the other one I hit through the bone, but it went still went all the way through. So it just gives you those shot options, I think, that you don't have with a mechanical. And I know some of the bro- the mechanical heads I used in the past would fold. They just crunch uh, yeah. in, with that kind of... Well, I yeah. also tested um, bone impact, and when I shot through the shoulder blades, the, me- the mechanicals were getting through, but the blades were often breaking or bending, and there was no edge left on them. I mean, yeah. you could not cut yourself with those edges once they went through a, a shoulder blade. And I was shooting through the thinnest part of that moose shoulder blade I could I could find. I also then shot through, and, and then our broadhead would still shave hair after it went through, and it looked like looked like new, right? And yeah. then I shot the leg bone, which is, you know, that's like three-inch diameter bone, and the mechanicals were pretty much exploding on impact. You know, those ferrules were just breaking and pieces were flying and with our broadhead i actually penetrated all the way through the moose bone i posted this on our instagram yeah and buried into the reinhardt target behind it Dang. and so i didn't think i was actually going to make it through it but it did and it still spun true you know, and that's the that's kind of worst case north america i think is that moose leg bone comes back yep. and you're shooting at the vitals and you have to go through that um, upper leg bone and i'm not saying it would always go through depending on your arrow weight and setup and things like that but it definitely gives you a lot more margin for for error of hitting those bones on a, on a deer or, or anything like that which i think is everything it's like well, you you just can't afford to hunt and hunt with the well if everything goes exactly right then this is this setup's perfect right because it doesn't no, I, there's I was always a, with a, a Tim branch. Gilling, or, I talked to Tim Gillingham yeah. for like a half He's hour. He's been a big saying, NAP fan. Yeah, is it? Don't you think there's any, zone. any application where a fixed play is better than a mechanical? Any? He's like, no, no way. <laughs> you know, he's so. But, he, thing he, but with, he can hit. You know, he can hit right where he's aiming. Well, at speed. you're talking about one of the best ar- archers in the world. Right. You're also talking about a dude that's got like a seven foot wingspan. Right. That shoots freaking you know 500 grain bombs right down range because he's got yeah. such a long draw like tim well what if you hit that leg bone he's like well then you made a bad shot yeah like, well some of us do that you know well, sometimes that happens to I, people and, and so that's why i was saying earlier there's more than one way to skin a cat yeah. tim has that luxury in a sense where that nap kill zone eats up momentum eats up your arrow speed if you got yeah. a lightweight yeah. arrow and you know you don't have a particularly fast bow to begin with it's not super efficient. And, and you hit that animal and that blade comes out. I've seen situations with that exact broadhead where it just stops. It goes in a few inches and just stops. Mm. It just gets, and instead of cutting, it sort of just drags. Yeah. In fact, the mule deer that I, I shot in Alberta, I shot it four times, man. Hmm. And I shouldn't have, it shouldn't have taken that many arrows. shouldn't have taken that many arrows. I learned my lesson. I mean, if it works for Gillingham, it works for Gillingham. But for me, I like planning for all the uh, the potential bad scenarios that happen. Cause yeah, for sure. To me, if it's I'm planning for not the best case scenario on a shot. I'm planning for worst. Therefore, and I think a lot of people think, well, with the worst case scenario shot with a mechanical, you get this giant hole. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my experience just it hasn't worked out as well as a fixed. Yeah, I think you're just way better off getting that penetration, getting a cu- a hole, you know, through more organs. You know, the, yeah. the further you go, you know, get get to that second lung and not the first lung, things like that. You know, Eric from uh, Muley Freak just used started using our broadheads on a hunt, and, and he yeah. filmed this hunt, and he had a shot on a, on a mule deer. It was 51 yard shot. He was actually it was walking, and then it stopped as he shot, and so he shot a little far forward, and he went through the near side shoulder blade in front of the lung. Went through, hit the far side lung, and went through the far side shoulder blade and got a pass through with our broadhead. And he's been a mechanical guy. And, and he stopped by our booth again today and said that, uh, you know, with the mechanicals I was shooting, I would not have recovered that deer. I, I might have made it through the shoulder blade, but it wouldn't have made it to that far lung. And, and, um, and with our broadhead, it zipped through. It ran like 70, 70 80 yards and just dropped dead. It's all going to be in his Muley Freak film. Nice. Uh, coming out he said yeah like three angles on it so he's got the <laughs> that's cool <laughs> he said this is going to be like one of the top kill shots on film ever i'm really looking forward to it coming out but yeah he sold it he's been a mechanical guy but he's like man you know just the margin for error with this broadhead he's he's changed his mind on it so. yeah i mean the big the big draw to the mechanical for me was flight arrow flight you know mm-hmm. And wind or arrow flight, just without all the the drag and and right. the, the deflection, 
it flies real true. It flies real nice. But turns out the reality for me is uh, with these other broadheads that are out like yours, you're able to achieve that kind of flight out to 100 or more yards with accuracy. Yeah, a lot of people have had, and I did too, have experience with two blades in the past that were big and mm-hmm. not being able to fly very well. And, and mine started out bigger and it got shorter over, over the years. And I did a lot of... Uh, you know, flow analysis, computational fluid dynamics to really look at the drag and the shape and try to optimize that to the point where, yeah, because I, like I like to hunt mule deer and I like to be able to take a 60-yard shot and hit right where I'm aiming for sure. And um, and I think they do that. We've, we've had a lot of guys um, that are better shots than me that are, are grouping tight at 80, 100 yards plus with them. In nice. fact, we had a guy by our booth yesterday. This is the longest shot I've heard of. And uh, I shouldn't even say this, um, but it was a follow-up shot. Yeah. I mean, his first shot, he just shot a little back and a liver, and then it ran out and stopped again. And he, he knew that he wanted to put another one through it. Range it was 128 yard. This is Woo. an elk. Yeah. And but it's straight. It's down. It was like a 90 yard, 91 yard cut. But he he smoked it and got a pass through shot at 128 yards on his follow-up <laughs> shot with our broadhead. I probably shouldn't tell those stories, but it was a follow-up shot. So I think at that, oh, I think at that point, you take the shot. So. Yeah, I agree. When it comes to ranges, there's a lot that can go wrong the further away the, the object is. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's guys that are effective, like Gillingham and others who I've seen shoot. and it, It's hard to argue with the results. He shot the elk. Yeah, I think you got to know your um, you got to know your limitations. Be yeah. honest with yourself about but, your limitations. And you I know. agree. But if you know, I shot a, bu- a buck this year at 92 yards in Montana. I had that deer. I shot for probably two hours before we went out on that evening hunt. Mm-hmm. And I was stacking them at 90, 95 yards in a 18 and 1 Reinhardt just with the broadheads, just boom, 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 to the point where I was like, all right. I was super confident going into the field. And then mm-hmm. there's the buck. An hour later at 92, I did exactly what I did 20, 30 times. You know, that's great. On the target, and I and I hit it perfect center punch down. Would I do that after hunting in the bush for a week and not shooting my bow at all and not being fresh and not quite knowing? No, uh uh, conditions got to be right too. I I, I took a shot two years ago on my antelope, um, 85 yard shot, and you know, I'd been. I've been practicing daily. It was all through the summer into August, and I was I felt like perfectly dialed. And this this buck was broadside. Then he went slight quartering away. He was looking away. I knew he wasn't going to get closer. No wind, looking away. I just thought, well, if I if I feel real confident, you know, I drew back. My pins right on him. I felt good. Squeezed it off and heart shot, man. Just yeah. smoked him. And, but the conditions were perfect. And you like were you said, calm. I was calm, yeah. confident. It, was, it wasn't like I ran up a ridge and you know took a shot. Oh, at believe it. me, there's been there's times. A big difference there. Three so. three days prior to that day, I had been at full draw at about eighty to ninety yards, but didn't feel confident. Windy. My heart was a little rate was a little too high, and I I let down and was like, if it felt right, I was going to shoot. Mm-hmm. Just never did. And it just turns out on that last shot, on that, that last day, that everything was right. So, like you said, you got to know your abilities. Yeah, I mean, I've passed Stay up forty yard you. shots when I draw back and the wind's pushing on me and yeah. I'm not steady. And you just you just gotta you gotta feel comfortable or confident that a high percentage they're gonna make that shot. Yeah, right. So, Bill, where can people find Iron Will Broadheads? Yeah, our website is uh, IronWillOutfitters.com. Our Instagram is at IronWill. Outfitters um, and Facebook is Iron Will Outfitters also. Awesome. All right. All right. I'm excited for you. Great. Let's stay in touch. Stop by. We'll get you set up for okay. next year. All right. And uh, folks, check it out. Give uh, Iron Will a, a, a look. And uh, as always, thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty. You thanks for having me on, Brian. Thank you. Um, welcome back. Brent and I have a, uh, a little agenda to cover today. Brent, what's first on the list? Um, we need to talk about our newsletter and our giveaways. All right. So we have a gritty newsletter that we're going to send out on April 1st. We are giving ourselves a hard date <laughs> to commit to because we're pro- we're not procrastinating. That's not the right word. We've been working towards it. We're just very busy. The plate's very full. Yeah. We are, uh, we're going to commit to April 1st, get our first newsletter out. When we did the open season, 
we put up as part of the giveaway a Hoyt bow. The Hoyt Helix. And we have that bow still. We have not given it away. In fact, we got a message a couple days ago. Um, it was actually a YouTube comment, YouTube comment that came out. This was on the Ozcut Broadheads with Nick Morton and Jerry Redman. He, it's by Hard Hat Outdoors, Kyle Ammon. I would like to see who the winner is of the Hoyt bow that you're giving away during your video series last fall. That's a good idea for your newsletter. I'm not sure if I missed it or if the giveaway hasn't happened yet. Keep up the good work. Yeah. So we were doing a giveaway for the newsletter. We had a little trouble with the newsletter. We had a new website and a new yeah, mail delivery we, system. We went from the old Gritty Bowman to BrianCall.com. Anyway, ran into some glitches. But we've been planning to, to do another push for the newsletter and then give away the bow. We are going to give away the bow on April 1st in the first newsletter that we send out. How's that? Sounds great. What the heck, Brent? It was a silent yawn. Yeah, did you see that comment on YouTube the other day? Yeah, the gritty yawn man. And let me tell you, people, I work myself to the bones (laughs) for this podcast. He's just like... Couldn't stand watching Brent yawn every three minutes throughout Couldn't the entire interview. Couldn't even see me yawn. Interview. I yawned one time in the beginning, and you addressed it. <laughs> if you hadn't addressed it, no one would have thought anything of Whatever. it. They'd have been like, wow, that's a hardworking young man right there. <laughs> Brent needs to get control of himself, stop yawning during the podcast. Or we film this during reasonable hours. It's 3.20. For the first <laughs> time ever, we are filming in the daylight, folks. <laughs> anyway. We are going to give away that bow. Sign up for the newsletter at briancall.com. We're going to send out our first letter April 1st, and in that letter, we'll announce the winner. Anyone who has signed up for the newsletter, we have your email address. We're just going to pull randomly from that. We'll pull randomly live on Instagram, and then we'll put it in the newsletter and send it out. We have a segment that we want to start doing called Deals and Discounts, where we have discounts from folks that have been on our podcast. Yeah, if you have a product or you have something you want to offer through to, you know, to give value to our audience, let us know and uh, we'll evaluate it. Right now, our buddy Tanner over at Stockasins, he's just got a small business of sweet, handmade, artisanal, if that's a trigger word for y'all, they're moccasins. Moccasins, like high top moccasins. For, yeah, that you can cinch up. Yeah, for sneaking on deer and such, you know, being real quiet, stocking feet where you won't get stabbed by cactuses and other rough things those are available give them a give them some business if it's a product you think you'll use or that you value we have a stock podcast episode you can go back and check that out if you want to learn more about it but if you enter the code gritty mm-hmm. uh, at checkout go yeah. to lone peak leather co yeah you can get those at a good discount there's that and then we have some stuff coming up with some deals and discounts with mountain ops and some of our other partners we just haven't got it set up yet but stay tuned the end of each show, we're going to start rolling those out and uh, give you guys codes and, and opportunities to save some money and get some cool stuff. Things I like and things I hate. That is the next segment. I like that. I stole it right from Ben Shapiro. It's it's, it's smart, though. Things I, I did, like. Did you see Ben Shapiro the other day when he got his pudding joke stolen? Yeah, I saw that. That yeah. was. <laughs> was uh... And first of all. The guy who stole his impression of the pudding, mm-hmm. not as good as Ben. No. Ben's no. Ben's impression of the pudding that is was spot Colbert, on. That Colbert, I think. Anyway, yeah. PETA. PETA recently... Done messed up. <laughs> they recently went after Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Brent grew up with Steve Irwin. Steve Irwin, I don't know if you he's know this, like folks. He's a hero. He's not necessarily a hero, but he is. He's He's been given sainthood. By the Catholic Church. He is actually a saint. I don't know if you all know that. I didn't know that. That's not true. But he (laughs) might as well be. Like, that's how the internet is acting about it. I love it because I, particularly, I hate PETA in general because... They're hypocritical people that slaughter a lot of animals. They're just crazy. So, tell us us what happened, Brent. PETA sent a tweet. What's the tweet? So, what happened was, is Google Doodle, if if everyone is familiar with that, Google on their front page, when you go to Google.com... The Google logo, it changes. And sometimes it's a game you can play. Sometimes it's just a funny picture, depending on like if it's Black History Month or if it's like Einstein's birthday, whatever. They change it up all the time. Well, it was Steve Irwin's birthday, so they changed it. So it was a slideshow mm-hmm. of all the conservational stuff that Steve did while he was alive. Conservation. 
Yes, he's yeah. a conservationist. He saved animals. Oh, yeah. It brought so much awareness mm-hmm. to, to their needs and so on. And yeah. So Google tweets this out. Uh-huh. Well, Peter tweets back at him. Steve Irwin got what he got because he was harassing an animal, and that's what he did. His career was him going out and harassing animals. And wild animals should be left alone and unmolested. And the rest of the internet realized <laughs> that that was a really stupid thing to say and do. And if you guys will go and you'll just Google PETA Steve or PETA Steve Irwin, you will just see thousands of memes or <laughs> tweets that people have been just launching back at them. Which Brent has shown me like 10 today of enjoyable memes. I've giggled a lot today. PETA uh, is getting hammered. So don't mess with Steve Irwin. No doubt. No, yeah, that, he's but a like, legend. People do the same thing with hunters, though, too. You know, we're familiar with this treatment. We go out and probably do more for wildlife than than just about any other group. Yes, but according to everyone else, we murder those animals. <laughs> I did run into a gal who told me the other day on YouTube that she liked my bear charge video, which if you haven't seen it, go to briancall.com and go to the films, and uh, you'll see Charge by Grizzly Bear. That little video is is keeps climbing in the ranks on YouTube ever so slowly. It just mm-hmm. every it dark horsed all the rest of the yeah videos. every day or two it gets a it didn't do so hot in the beginning, but it's somehow it's hit the YouTube algorithms and and it's just churning now. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. It's a good little video. Just because bears are bears, people chime in and give their two cents about it. And one of the things this gal wrote the other day, I would enjoy these videos. If they all ended without the killing of an animal like this video does. The murdering of an animal. The murdering of an animal. I wrote back to her. and Very I, politely. I do this every time, you know, when I can, to say murdering pertains to humans. Yes. To human life. It's when another human, you know, premeditates the death and kills another human. There's no such thing as murdering an animal. There's not. There's killing an animal. They're not murdering. Murdering has to do with humans, purely to do with humans. It has nothing to do with animals. And when you conflate the two, you're messed up. It's not a murder to kill a chicken for dinner. That's not murder. That's killing, and and we need to own that, but it's not murder. No. Brian, what's something that you hate? Something I hate. All right, folks. One thing I hate is is internet outrage. In in a way, PETA is right now reaping the the cold-hearted brutality of internet outrage. I should say that I don't like internet outrage that is unjustified. Internet outrage is okay, but it needs to be followed with correct facts. PETA came out and slandered a dead saint on his birthday. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Right. What we're about to talk about is a severe misunderstanding. It it goes along... So, for example, when Brett Kavanaugh is accused of rape and or a then bunch of high schoolers the internet are called and the white media, supremacists yeah or the covington kids are white supremacists and they did all these things and the media comes out and says or jussie smollett goes out and fakes a, a a hate crime and and they say that yeah two white guys wearing maga hats that this is maga country and put a noose around his neck when you see these things happen okay online and then people without evidence or without knowledge lose their mind over it it's a problem that's what I don't like. It's like the NRA Yeti thing. Yeah. This is a perfect example of the NRA thing. So the thing that I hate today, the thing that I hate, is this Benchmade thing that people Fiasco. are freaking out about. What happened was I've talked to a number of close friends who are all police officers, talked to different police departments. And what's the normal process when police officers confiscate weapons from people who are murdering people from gang members from drug dealers what happens when they take their guns away where do those guns go ultimately ultimately most of the time in most states across the nation those guns cannot be resold to the public in any way because of the liability that comes with it it wouldn't be really cool to the american public If the police department took a gun from a drug dealer and then sold it to somebody in an auction or some kind of buyer program, and then that person went and murdered a bunch of kids in a school. Or that gun blew up in their face. Or that gun blows up in their face. Because crackheads don't keep good care of their guns. (laughs) Right. Like Brent said, there's a liability associated with selling a weapon that our police departments are just cannot bear. 
you know, it's, it'd be foolish. They destroy those guns. These are guns taken from criminals and then recycled. That is not the same thing. Not the same thing as the police come to my door, take my gun as a law-abiding citizen, and then destroy it. They're totally different things. They're not the same thing. One is statism. One is akin to Nazi Germany. They come to your door. They take your gun away from a law-abiding citizen and they destroy it. That's, that, is, that is totally against the Second Amendment, against everything that I value and believe in. Then you have guns confiscated from criminals and drug dealers and so on that then have to be disposed of. Completely different situation. And those guns were then from the Oregon City Police Department, which I have friends from high school and buddies I grew up with that are part of the, the Oregon City Police. We have friends that work at Benchmade, too. And that's the other thing. And I have close friends that work at Benchmade. This Benchmade was three minutes from my house mm -hmm. when I lived in Oregon City. Half of my friends from church and half of my buddies from hunting circles. My wife's nurse, when she had cancer, her husband is a sales rep at Benchmade and has been there forever. These people support things like ladies hunting camp. They mm -hmm. support like the Yows. groups like Ben Born and Raised Outdoors, Randy and Candy Yow, other other hunting groups. They're pro hunting and they're pro Second Amendment. They're that's, in our camp. That's what Benchmade is. Period. We meaning like tactical and gun nuts go and they see a photograph of Benchmade destroying guns, breaking recycling guns. That belong that were confiscated through the police department, and people lose their ever living mind over this and freak out because oh, Benchmade is Nazi Germany. Nazi They're Germany. Away our guns. And they didn't have to participate in the process. It's sad that we can't be pro Second Amendment and also support police departments and cops. It's like what? Why are we anti cop over this? The cops are doing their job too. Their job is to go out and protect us. So they take guns from criminals. And then they chucked the guns. That's okay. They didn't take my gun. They didn't take your gun. They didn't take a law-abiding citizen's gun. Wrap your mind around this. I can't believe the insanity that followed this whole thing. So I hate it. I hate it. I wish people would like step back and actually get some facts and think about things before they lose their mind. So here we are in our own community, slitting our own throat when you have an organization like Benchmade who cares about hunting, who cares about Second Amendment, who's on our team, and we cannibalize ourselves mm -hmm. when you have groups like PETA out there insane and totally against us and we're, 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 but we're killing our own. So there's my, there's my things I hate. One other thing is that I feel like they're just helping out the cops. The, yeah, the, the county absolutely. would have to spend money. Your, your money as a tax paying citizen would go towards the destruction of those guns. Yeah. And I don't think people realize that bench made is the, the cost the street. They probably walked over there. They probably even hop in a car to take the, the guns. The Oregon city police department and bench made are like, a block away. They're like in the same shopping center type thing. So it's a little business part. It just the whole thing is crazy. So if you're one of those people that went after Benchmade, shame on you. Shame. Shame, shame. Next. Brian, what are you listening to right now? Or like what are you watching? You got any YouTubes or any uh, podcasts? So if you haven't seen our buddy Jerry Redmond's video with a bow hunt down under. Brian, you said it wrong. There's no R. Oh, oh. Down under. Down under with uh, Adam Greentree's film, The Descendants, you should go check it out. Go to Bow Hunt Down Under on Instagram or on YouTube and watch that. That's that's one uh, I'm watching lately. One that I haven't checked out yet, but I'm very I'm gonna start. I'm gonna check it out. Is Anyone's Hunt on the Onyx map? Onyx isn't like a partner of mine, but love what they do. They have a great film, so I'm very curious. Their first video at fifty thousand views, and then the following videos got like. 15, 19,000. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the first one's just better or if they just lost momentum after the first one. But I'm going to check it out. So what were they hunting? That's what I'm looking at. Various that things. That used a species thing. Various But stuff. the first one was an elk or a whitetail, <laughs> and the next one was like a turkey. I don't know. We can check, Brent. Because we're species. Species? We hunters, we're speciesists. We have our species, and if you're not of the species we like to hunt, we don't care. I don't know. I, I do. It might be true. It might not. I think... Uh, okay, here we go. I'll tell you. What was the first one? Episode one. Anyone's hunt. Episode one. Arizona, Arizona mule, mule deer. Episode, episode two. two is also Arizona mule deer. Three, Arizona mule deer. And four, Arizona... So they're all Arizona mule deer. And there's your problem. And number five, Arizona mule deer. Really, I have no idea 
They're all six, five, nine. They're short. That first one's only four minutes, Brent. They're all under ten minutes, folks. Mm. I like a short hunting film. That means they've trimmed the fat. <laughs> I don't want this forty-five minute one stock so, fiasco. So, Brian, yep, did you work out today? Today's workout is a one and a half hour ruck hike. Which, as soon as this podcast is over, I'm going to climb that mountain right there. I'm going to go lift weights. I'm going to lift weights afterward. Squat, deadlift, and overhead press. That's exactly what I'm going to go do. That's my go-to workout. Like, if I don't want to think about what I'm going to work out, that's what it is. Yeah. Squat heavy, deadlift heavy. I have to go kind of wimpy on the overhead press. You're missing a pectoral. I'm missing a couple of muscles. You're weird. Yeah. Um, Defective. No, I'll usually do handstand push-ups, and then I'll switch to uh, overhead press after and call it. That way I get some upper body. I might do 100 push-ups with a weighted vest. That's mm-hmm. kind of what I've been doing lately is either the push-ups or the presses. Let's go to the mailbag. All right. Mailbag, mailbag. Brian Birch, two days ago or so, on the movie Suzanne that he watched on YouTube, he writes, Thank you so much for sharing this part of your life with us, Brian. My wife and I watched with tears in our eyes. We lost our 20-year-old son to cancer, and this video brought back a lot of memories. Suzanne seems so sweet, smiling through her treatments. I can't begin to imagine what was going through both your minds during this tough time with your young family. The lesson I learned through our ordeal is none of us lives forever. None of us are guaranteed a long life. The challenge for me is to truly live each day as if it was the last healthy day I have. Much easier said than done. God bless you, Suzanne, and your kids. That was a nice message. And I, uh, my heart goes out to you to, to lose your 20-year-old son to cancer. I hope that doesn't happen to me. I realize life isn't fair. You just don't. There are no guarantees. I realize I could use lose my wife or one of my kids at any time. And I like to say I'm prepared for it. But as you saw in this film, it's easier said than done. But I will say this, that gratitude, thankfulness for what I have right now and everything in my life, instead of focusing on things that aren't what I want them to be or all the things I don't have, like focusing on all the things I have and being grateful for that, man, that's the key. That's that's a big key for me. And like Brian said, none of us lives forever. That's the lesson he learned. None of us are guaranteed a long life. The challenge for me is to truly live each day as if it was the last healthy day. That's the key there is to be grateful. Like right now, where you're at and the situation you're in, just like for what you have, which is health. You know, for many of us, it's good health. I have great health. The other thing I tell myself each day is this is my ride. Like you got this one life. It's my ride. I'm going to, I'm going to, Try to make the most of it every day. So I've got something uh, not quite as profound of a question for the mailbag. This is a YouTube comment that was left on our recent sex and testosterone podcast with, with Dr. Hillary Lampers from Extreme Country, yeah, Extreme Country Outdoors. What is your favorite mountain ops to drink when you're up hiking that will keep energy levels high? I've said this before. <laughs> I like to mix Pedialyte with Ignite. Ooh. So until Mountain Ops comes up with the, um, electrolyte. the electrolyte that I want them to come up with, that I've been working on getting them to come up with. I love Pedialyte for some reason when I'm up hiking, sweating, going all hardcore. I like to mix Pink Lemonade Ignite with Pedialyte. I think some people just, their body ditches vitamins and minerals through sweat. I do. And you, I think our entire family does. Yeah, we have a family who consumes tons and tons of salt and still seem to not have enough salt yeah it's just i think it's that's a genetic aspect. i've seen our grandfather eat handfuls of salt me too when he went to fly a plane he didn't want to have to pee yeah or a salt. long drive <laughs> yeah <laughs> what would kill me is he'd take a handful of salt and, just... and then he'd pick up his diet his two liter of diet <laughs> soda and he would finish it on the on the drive but never pee if you haven't heard the podcast with my grandpa you're missing out. It's is one of the best podcasts I think we've done. I've had a ton of people write in and ask about it called Olden Times, Grit, and the Way Things Used to Be with Grandpa Joe. Check that one out. And He'll uh, tell you the best ways how to dodge a draft. <laughs> yes. Different times, man. Different times. And so if you think about how we have it today, I wish we could ship all these millennials like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to someplace like... Anything with the last name Stan in it. <laughs> like, Take- go, go to one of these. Go to Venezuela. I'd like you to live there for a while. Like, you name it. If our young people 
were required to spend some time in a foreign country, just about any one of them. You mean a bleep hole country? They would come back to the United States more appreciative of what they have. The other day I saw a poll where people were, were saying, like, everyone over something like 40 says socialism is a really bad idea. Yeah. And then everyone under 20 or 25 is like, we should try this as if it hasn't been tried yeah. for 200 years. Like, it's just insane. Sometimes you have to be around, I think, the world long enough to know that like, it's a no-brainer for the people yeah. who have, who watched the Cold have, War. Anyway. One last segment, and then yes. we're gone, folks. Kay. The final final segment is news. news. What's upcoming? What do we got going on, Brian? There is a Utah uh, tag application deadline coming up very soon, March 7th. Mm. So if you're planning to apply to Utah, don't let that. Don't let that. Uh, no, date folks, pass don't you by. don't apply. There's no need. I need to apply, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> if you are uh, a Utah resident or non-resident, and you want to get some points, and you want to, ha- you have a a plan for Utah. Don't forget that. I tend to miss some of these things, so it's uh-huh. nice to have someone remind me. Utah. I did not think Utah was so good for hunting until I moved here. They're like Arizona. Yeah, there's way more uh, more opportunity than you think, and a lot of people only go to Arizona, only go to Utah when they draw that you know once tag in a lifetime after tag years of applying. But the reality is, is there's a lot of I'm I'm gonna start going and doing some small game hunting with my wife. Just go up on a weekend, get a little twenty two. Yeah, you some should stuff. chucker hunt. <laughs> what, why do you say it like that, Brian? Maybe I will chucker hunt. <laughs> well, you might need to get in a little better shape, my friend. Maybe, <laughs> or maybe I'll find a way to call Chucker to me. I just feel that your skill set involves more like duck hunting from a blind in sub-zero temperatures. No, rather that than, sounds terrible. Rather than chasing Jay Byer and Matt Davis up a mountain. Well, they've got like 12 feet long legs. Like they can, they cover like every one of their steps is like seven of mine. Well, no, I think guys are about the same height. I think it has more to do with. The, the tire on my middle. Girth. I'm fat, <laughs> Brian. Goodness gracious. I, I own I, mirrors. I walk you, by several reflective services it. throughout the day. You said it. I didn't say it. But I'm glad you're going to go work out. We need to keep Brent on the workout train. Anyways, folks, we have coming up a gritty film mountain ops tour. Yeah. We did the we're, look we for did the, mountain ops the gritty film, night. film tour. Gritty mountain ops film tour. Mountain ops gritty film tour. We're going to take our Moose film and, and, and a couple others, even this Kodiak film with Cole Kramer and Leopold, my buddy uh, Tim Lester. If you guys saw heard, watch those podcasts, we have killer footage from that. Adam Foss did a lot of the camera work. I captured some stuff. And, and anyway, I think it's cool. I hope that makes it into it. But regardless, we're still showing Untamed, my Moose film, in the tour. And we're going to try to hit five or six locations. And we're planning to do that over the months of, uh, well, we haven't quite decided. We'll know more in a week or two. But we're going to do the whole kit and caboodle. We're going to show up in your town. We're going to have it at the theater. We're going to sell out the tickets. And then we're going to raffle some stuff. We're going to raffle stuff and just have a good old night with some Our cool last, films. The Mount Ops film night, they gave away several bows. They were giving away coolers. They were giving away backpacks. Not saying it's going to be that epic. But we're going to have some fun stuff to give away. Yeti gear, Leopold gear. All, all my partners pitched in good and, and big and really helped. And they plan to do that some more. So, And then in August, we're going to do open season. Another open season where we launch uh, YouTube videos every week to get you all stoked. All stoked for the September We're going to try and season. get this done before the hunting season this time so people actually have gear for their hunts. Yeah, I'd like it to be be done. I would like to maybe launch uh just because some some of us get out and start hunting by August 20th. We're going to probably start around July 20th. Look for that too. Middle of July till about the end of August. I think at the end of that we're going to drop our uh our films from the from the film tour as well as part of that digital series. So 
Uh, man, I'm excited. We have a lot of fun stuff in the in the makings. So speaking of, you got your BHA rendezvous up in Boise. Yep, the BHA rendezvous. There's so much cool stuff going on all year now. I mean, there's our hunts, but then there's a lot of hunter get together events and activities you can do throughout the year. There's the, all the total, the total archery, archery challenge, challenge and the BHA rendezvous is just one of those annual things that you come get some tickets for, attend, hang out with new other hunters and i love the bha rendezvous because of the the like-minded people there that are very very dedicated to public lands and i always like it when i go to some place and i can wear my camo pants and everyone else is wearing their camo pants yeah there's cook-offs and i think renilla might be doing a, a live podcast or something there's just different things so you should check it out that is may 1st 2nd 3rd and 4th i believe maybe the 5th too i'm not sure but it's May around May 1st. So check that out. And then there's the Total Archery Challenge in Pennsylvania on May 30th, 31st, and June 1st. There's the Total Archery Challenge in Terry Peak, which is June 21st, 22nd, 23rd. And then there's the Park City here in Salt Lake City, the Utah uh, T- Total Archery Challenge. It's been moved to Park City, which I'm pretty stoked about i I mean snowbird was epic but Mm -hmm. the actual course was pretty incredible but the venue itself was a little smushed smushed and and you just had sort of it was hard to interact as much so i'm kind of that's why i actually recommended families go to to the big sky event because it was just so much more open you could interact a little better with kids and but the park city one should be cool i'm excited to see that this year, that's July 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th. And then you have Big Sky July 19th, 20th, and 21st. So those are the Total Archery Challenge events I'm looking into going to. I know there's one in Vermont, but it's I those I have dates that conflict with that. And then the weekend of the BHA Rendezvous, I believe, is the San Antonio, Texas total archery challenge which would be um again the may 1st 2nd 3rd 4th somewhere in there go to the total archery challenge uh website and you can see all those events so man those are awesome if you have one close to your area i highly recommend you make a weekend out of it and you go do it but get in quick because once sean sells all the tickets out you know, you're buying tea times in some places where it's where it, you know it's just real crowded. The earlier you get in, the earlier you get your tickets. And you know, we had to freeze out a lot of people last year because there just wasn't. There's only so. It's like golf, right? Mm-hmm. You can only have so many people on the course at once. Otherwise, you just have people standing around for ever. And unlike golf, you're not flinging a ball. Yeah, you're shooting an arrow. But man, it's such a cool event. Tax so, fun. That's the that's the final news. That's all the upcoming events to look forward to, I think, over the next few months. If you got questions about whatever, send them in. If there's a topic you want us to cover, let us know what you think. We're trying to – we're experimenting with formats with the podcast. That's why this is <laughs> at the can, end. As you can see. Let us know um, what you think. We love your feedback. Sign up for our newsletter, Winnehoy Bo, and – We're going to be doing other giveaways. Yep. Soon as we have that newsletter hammered out – by April 1st. <laughs> We're going to be starting doing a lot more. I'll probably once or twice a month, we'll be doing little giveaways here and there. Yeah. And look forward to the Mountain Offs podcast. It's a different show, different flavor than what we're doing here. <clears throat> I'm a I'm a co-host on that show. It's a, it's a fun show. Fitness oriented. Check that one out when it drops. We're not, we, were gonna, we were shooting for March 1st. But no. uh, the Hunt Expo and all the shows really just really derailed. We don't have enough content to kick off the show yet, but it's on its way. So look for mm-hmm. that too. Thank you f- for everything. Everyone that tunes into the show, appreciate all the love. We just ask that you stay gritty.